Good evening, everybody. Uh, before I start, I would also like to thank uh, Rick Dublin and MAPS for what I understand has been a great conference again. Uh, I'm sorry I missed it because I was you know, very, very sick to the point that I couldn't do the keynote and I apologize for, for uh, not showing up, but I was really, really sick. I'm not quite uh, where I should be, I'm still about 100 uh, degrees uh, temperature, but I didn't want to miss, miss uh, this one. So, so um, I will not be ha uh, shaking hands and I will not be hugging, just sort of keep away from me. I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> bring in any, any germs. Um, I understand that we have mixed audience now. Some people who are uh, part of the uh, holotropic breathwork group, and then some. Can I see just the hand of people, hands of people who uh, just came to listen to to this part? Okay, quite a few. Okay. You know, there's actually a, a certain overlap between what would have been the keynote and what's the preparation for for uh, the holotropic breathwork because we have to somehow prepare people uh, theoretically, not just explain what we would be doing. So this evening we'll have two parts. In the first one I will talk about uh, the kind of psychology that we have to uh, use in order to work with holotropic states. And then the second half of the evening uh, be uh, the nuts and bolts, you know, what we will be doing in the breathwork uh, itself. Uh, those of you who, who came just for this evening are welcome to stay for the second half of the talk. It might be a little frustrating to get the detailed information and not, uh, not do it. Okay, let me, let me start the way I usually start, although I don't think it's really necessary in this, in this group. I ask some questions to uh, the audience. How many of you experienced uh, in your everyday life any of those uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness that we have? Can you read it? Can you? Yeah. There's a, there is a series of uh, experiences. So, I think it's redundant in this group, but we can we can still do it. Uh, can we see the hands? Okay. Uh, it doesn't look much different anywhere uh, where we go. Now, um, I ask these questions for basically for two reasons. One is that everything I will be talking about comes from uh, the study of non-ordinary states of consciousness. And then the second one is that uh, holotropic breathwork is uh, a method that is using the healing, transformative, evolutionary, and uh, heuristic, that's H-E-U-R, heuristic uh, potential of, of non-ordinary states of consciousness. And what's very interesting is that current psychiatry does not really have a special name for these states. Uh, we have just one name, which is altered states of consciousness, uh, which puts together, you know, everybody from uh, trivial deliria, delirium tremens, uh, uh, hallucinations that you have during typhoid fever, and all the way to something that would happen during uh, meditation. And we see all those states as being pathological in one way or another. Um, we don't have a special category of mystical state or spiritual, spiritual experience. So people who have these experiences, uh, they tend to get a diagnosis and uh, there's a tendency to suppress these states when they appear spontaneously. And we have as a culture, the industrial civilization actually outlawed, uh, you know, uh, means and, uh, and context for, for uh, inducing some of these states. Now I have been so far talking about uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness. 
actually psychiatrists are using a different term which is altered states of consciousness which I really don't like uh, it suggests to me that there's a correct way of experiencing ourselves and the world and then in these states it's somehow distorted uh, I always have to think about veterinary medicine you know you, you, your pet altered so, <laughs> so uh, I have too much respect for these states to call them altered states but even the uh, term uh, non-ordinary is too broad. You know, you can be, you, you can have some uh, post-traumatic changes of, uh, of consciousness. Uh, you can be very drunk and be in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. So there is a certain special subcategory of, of uh, these non-ordinary states that I've been interested in. And they have healing potential, they have transformative potential, I believe they have evolutionary potential, and that term heuristic means uh, that they, they are also a source of revolutionary new information about consciousness, about uh, the human psyche, and even uh, the nature of uh, reality. So, uh, because I felt very strongly that we should have a special uh, term for this state, I started calling them holotropic. Holos, holon, in Greek means whole, and trepo, trepein, means moving in the direction of something. Like uh, um, heliotropism is a, is a property of the plant to always move in the direction of the, of the sun. So it means moving toward wholeness. These are states that move us toward wholeness. Now this is a term that surprises many people from the Western industrial civilization. You know, the question arises, aren't we whole already? I mean, the way we experience ourselves in our everyday state of consciousness. And the answer uh, would have to be no. That in our ordinary state of consciousness, we identify only with a small fraction of uh, who we are. When I talk about it, I usually refer to Hinduism, kind of a nice uh, way uh, of explaining what is meant by this. In uh, um, the Hindu tradition, you would hear that we are not nama rupa, we are not name and form, name and shape, uh, that our true identity is actually with a, with a spark of divine creative energy that we carry in, in the core of our being. This is called Atman. And uh, this is not a belief or um, uh, fantasy of, of the Hindus. We, you have uh, schools of yoga, and if you practice systematically, you have a possibility of uh, have sort of... Uh, experiential validation. You, you can experience yourself as that divine energy and uh, if you have that experience of this core of your being, Atman, you realize that that energy is identical with the energy that created this cosmos, which is Brahman. So, so our identity is not body ego, is not Nama Rupa, is uh, Atman Brahman. And uh, Hinduism is not the only, uh, only religion that believes that. This uh, idea of the identity of the individual with totality, totality of uh, cosmic creative energy is the, the secret uh, core of all major religions. So you can, you can find st uh, statements, you know, in... in many, many different uh, spiritual scriptures. Muktananda used to say, Swami Muktananda used to say, uh, God dwells in you as you. If you uh, read the Upanishads, uh, where the question is raised, who are you, who are we? Uh, the answer is uh, in Sanskrit, Tattvam Asi, which is uh, usually uh, translated archaically, thou art that. You are it. You are Godhead. You, your true nature is uh, divine. In Islam, you find uh, 
whoever knows uh, himself knows uh, his Lord or her Lord. Uh, uh, you find uh, these kinds of statements in Christianity, you find it in, in Kabbalah, certainly in uh, Taoism, in Buddhism you hear, look inside, you are Buddha. Uh, so these holotropic states make it possible for us to um, somehow claim our full cosmic identity. Sometimes it happens in small steps, sometimes in the form of major breakthrough, major, major uh, jumps. We could use some other ways of formulating it. Um, the, the French uh, Jesuit and uh, paleontologist philosopher, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, that we are not human beings having spiritual experiences. We are spiritual beings having human experiences. And Alan Watts, uh, the British, British American philosopher and, and spiritual teacher used to say, we are not skin encapsulated egos. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the, the meaning behind that term holotropic. Those are states that uh, make it possible uh, to discover our, our cosmic status, our, our deepest, uh, deepest uh, uh, identity. Now, what, what are these states that we are talking about? This is not, hol not just holotropic breathwork. Uh, holotropic states are also states that uh, the novice shamans experience as part of their initiatory crisis when they have the experience of uh, traveling into the underworld, uh, being exposed to, to tortures and uh, 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 challenges and experience uh, death, dismemberment, and then coming together in a new way and, and uh, traveling into the supernal realm. These are also states that they then, as practicing shamans, induce in their clients for, <clears throat> for healing purposes. Uh, those are the states that are induced in uh, rites of passage in various native uh, cultures, the variety of means, you know, from uh, psychedelic plants all the way to um, chanting, fasting, uh, uh, sleep deprivation, uh, stay in the desert, stay in a cave, uh, dancing, chanting, uh, and even extreme measures like physical physical pain, like the Lakota Sioux sun dance or, or uh, the massive uh, bloodletting that you find in the uh, Lakandon Mayan uh, people and so on. So those are, <coughs> those are different uh, technologies of the, of the sacred, as I would call them. Now, in, another area where you would find holotropic states would be the ancient mysteries of death and rebirth that were very common, particularly in the Mediterranean area. The um, mysteries of Isis and Osiris, the mystery of, uh, of um, uh, Tammuz, Inan, Inanna and uh, Tammuz or Dumuzi, uh, the Bacchanalia, the, the Dionysian rite, the, the mysteries of Attis, Adonis, uh, uh, the Corybantic uh, rites, the Mithraic uh, uh, mysteries, or in Mesoamerica, the Shebalbe, the Mayan, Mayan uh, mysteries. So uh, those are some examples, and then of course we have the, the large category of these technologies of the sacred that were developed by the great religions of the, of the world. So you have different schools of yoga, you have uh, different forms of uh, Buddhism, you have Taoist, uh, exercises, Kabbalistic exercises. You find it in the Christian tradition, things like uh, Jesus' prayer, you know, the uh, Hesychasm, uh, Kabbalistic uh, 
exercises and so on. So it's a very large category of experiences and uh, they actually are responsible for the fact that we have ritual and spiritual life. We would not have religions without the, the founders and the, the disciples and the early followers having had these holotropic experiences. Now it's somewhat strange that uh, current psychiatry uh, would see these, these experiences as being psychotic, as being sort of pathological. You know, how would schizophrenic experience, there's about 1% incidence of schizophrenia uh, across the board in different, different countries, that psychotic experiences of 1% of the people would inspire the religions, would inspire building of Gothic cathedrals, uh, Muslim mosques, uh, incredible music, incredible art. I mean, there has to be something much more fundamental to uh, human nature than uh, pathology. Than, you know. So this is uh, something that really has to be corrected in, in psychiatry. I think it's just a you know, fundamental error to see these uh, experiences as being, uh, as being pathological. Now, I was, I was myself introduced to this category of experiences when, as a beginning psychiatrist, I volunteered for an LSD session at a time when I was quite disappointed with psychiatry. Uh, I went to study psychiatry because I read uh, Freud. And at that time, uh, when LSD came into my life, I already was realizing the limitations of psychoanalysis, how long it takes, uh, uh, how much money, how much time, how much energy. And uh, I was becoming aware of the fact that even after years, the results are not exactly breathtaking. <laughs> and, um, and I started kind of thinking about, uh, nostalgically, about uh, the profession that I chose originally, which was working in animated movies. Uh, <laughs> and um, if I think about it now, I didn't get so far from animated movies. When I was uh, but anyway, I was in that state of real disappointment and uh, uh, I was working at the psychiatric uh, department of the School of Medicine in Prague and we just finished a large, a large study of malaria, just one of the early tranquilizers, and it came from <coughs> excuse me, came from Sandus uh, pharmaceutical company in Switzerland. <clears throat> so we had a good um, working relationship with Sandoz, which means you know you get free literature. They might pay your trip to a conference when you report about their, their uh, preparations. And they also send you samples of other substances that they develop. And so as part of this uh, cooperation, we got a big box full of ampules, and it said LSD-25. And it came with a letter that described the story of discovery, which I'm sure everybody knows uh, in this group, the story of Albert Hoffman, you know, his uh, um, accidental uh, intoxication. Uh, <clears throat> you know, those of us who knew Albert well uh, heard the story from him very frequently that this was not really accidental, <laughs> that he, uh, he synthesized LSD first at, uh, in 1938 and sent it to the pharmacologist, toxicologist, and they sent it back and said nothing interesting and no further research recommended. And then he started, uh, LSD was like, LSD-25 was... 25th derivative of lysergic acid that he produced. And then from 38 he continued, he continued adding other side chains, uh, produced quite a few uh, other derivatives, but he said that as he was making additional derivatives, this particular substance somehow couldn't, he couldn't get it out of his head, that he had a strong feeling they must have overlooked something. And five years later, 1943, 
this feeling got so strong that he decided to make something that was absolutely exceptional, which is to make another sample and send it back to um, the um, pharmacologist for more careful, more careful uh, exploration. And uh, as he was synthesizing it, that of this, you know, his famous uh, kind of um, accidental um, uh, intoxication, and then several days later, his experiment when he took, he said, being a very conservative person, this very metic very uh, infinitesimal uh, dose, which was one fourth of. Uh, the dose of other ergot alkaloids was 250 micrograms. Uh, <clears throat> probably quite a few people in this group would re relate to that number. <laughs> so, so what came there was famous, his famous uh, bicycle ride, you know, through the streets of Basel, and then his experience of uh, uh, dying and uh, being hexed by his uh, neighbor, whom he considered to be a which, and then uh, asking for a doctor, and when the doctor came, he uh, was not dying anymore. He was now um, a newborn. He had relived his, his birth. So Santos was now sending, uh, there, was, there was one, one uh, intermediate thing, which was uh, Dr. Stoll, who was the, actually the son of uh, uh, Albert's bosses, boss, uh, Dr. Stoll uh, conducted a pilot study with a group of uh, psychiatric patients and group of quote-unquote normal people, and this in the late 40s became a scientific sensation. And so Santos was now sending these samples to, to various universities and research institutes, and we were one of the group that got this sample. and. Uh, came with a letter describing this whole story and uh, suggesting two possible uses. One was to use it as experimental psychosis where you can sort of give it to people and do all kinds of examinations before, during, and after and get some insights about what's happening biologically when people's psyche is so deeply influenced. And uh, the second one is something that became my destiny karma they said, you know, maybe this could be used as a kind of uh, uh, unconventional uh, training tool for psychiatrists and psychologists, um, nurses, students. You know, you could you could take it and spend a few hours in the world that seemed to be very similar to the world where some of your patients are living, and you'd be able to understand them better. You'd be able to communicate with them more effectively, and. Um, hopefully be more successful uh, in their treatment, you know, which was sorely needed at that point. You know. I was beginning psychiatrist. Was, psychiatry was really medieval. Those were insulin comas, electroshocks, uh, uh, cardiazol shocks, you know, and dunking patients in cold water and so on. Uh, uh, so I got very excited. By that time, I was really disenchanted with psychiatry, and this seemed like an exciting possibility. So I had my session, and uh, my preceptor uh, was very interested in electroencephalography. And at the time when I had the session, he was particularly interested in something that is called driving the brain waves or entraining the brain waves, which is you expose people to a big strobe, strobe light and then you change the frequencies and you study in the suboccipital area if the brain waves pick up the frequency that you're feeding in. So if you can control, the, if you can drive, if you can entrain the brain waves. So those of us who wanted the session, we had to agree uh, to have EEG before, during and after and also having our brain waves driven in the middle of that experiment. So I won't go into details. It's, uh, the whole story is in when the when the impossible happens uh, in my book. Uh, but to make a long story short, uh, 
between the third and fourth hour when my session was culminating, the research assistant came, said it was time to drive the brain waves and exposed me to this gigantic strobe and as she turned it on, you know, there was light like I had never seen. I thought it was like what it must have been like in Hiroshima. It just, today I think it's more like the Dharmakaya from Bardo Tudel, the, the primary clear light that you see at the time when you, when you die. And uh, my consciousness was catapulted out of my body. Um, I lost, uh, you know, the research assistant, Prague, the planet, and I had the feeling that I ceased to exist in the form that I was, had been before, and I had the feeling I became all of existence. And then there were some powerful experiences coming down of actually being in the, in the, the astronomical cosmos. And, and she was following the, you know, very carefully the protocol when the, all these things were happening to me. And then she turned it off and my consciousness started shrinking, and I found the planet, I found Prague, I found the clinic, I found my body, and then for a while, uh, my consciousness was sort of floating around my body, and I uh, had real difficulties to align those two, and it became clear to me that what they taught me at the university, that consciousness is somehow generated by the brain, by the neurophysiological activities in the brain, simply is a nonsense, that, co that consciousness is a, a cosmic phenomenon and that our brain somehow mediates it, but it certainly is not capable of generating something like uh, consciousness or that matter is not capable of generating something like uh, consciousness. And uh, I was stuck with psychiatry and uh, I felt <laughs> if you're, you know, if you are a psychiatrist, this is by far the most interesting thing you can study, these, these non-ordinary states, or what I call now holotropic, holotropic states. So this was 56, and I really have done very little professionally since that time they, that would not be related in one way or another to these non-ordinary states. It, it became my, my passion, my uh, profession, my... Uh, vocation, you know, that that uh, one day really changed my changed my life professionally and and personally, sent me in a completely new new direction. Uh, if I compare it to psychoanalysis, I spent seven years in psychoanalysis, three times a week. If you say, well, has it changed you? I would say, well, I. I, I I changed, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but seven years is a long time, you change anyway, and there was no, I mean, there was no, you know, there was no indication that any changes in my life really were related to what I was doing on the couch. I loved every, every moment of it, I loved to play with my dreams and so on. But in terms of it being a transforming experience, uh, that certainly uh, was not. Because as far as the session is concerned, I know I was one person walking into that room and somebody else walked out of there and there was just no doubt that, you know, what it was about. I mean, why, why it happened and how it, how it happened. Okay, I wanted to do something uh, in the keynote that I don't usually do uh, when we prepare people for the, for the breath work, but I <coughs> would like to do as a little uh, homage to uh, Albert Hoffman, uh, show you some uh, pictures of our, our meetings. I consider him my spiritual teacher. I mean, I, without uh, his discoveries, you know, my life would be very, very different. So this is the picture of uh, Albert Hoffman at the time when he discovered uh, LS, the psychedelic effects of LSD. This was a picture that was shown all over the world because it was a real scientific sensation. What very few people know is that the sensation was not the psychedelic effect. 
it was known that there are plants in various cultures that can have psychedelic effects, and mescaline was already known in a pure form. It was isolated at the turn of the centuries, 19th, 20th century. It was the incredible power. It was a thousand times stronger than mescaline. You know, to take 100 milligrams of mescaline to have a decent session, and 100 micrograms of LSD would be enough to do that. So, uh, this is what the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center looked like, where we did the, the research. I understand Bill uh, Richards talked about the research that we did there. So this is, did, has he shown any pictures of the, of the institute? Okay, so this is this was uh, uh, Albert's visit, uh, and the other two people are Walter Pankey famous for his uh, Good Friday experiment that Rick Doblin did a follow-up on, and Helen Bonney, was our music therapist, then developed guided imagery with music as an independent therapeutic method. This must have been like a, one of the visits 20 years ago in uh, uh, their home in a little village called Berg on the French... Uh, French-Swiss border, and this in the middle is Anita, uh, Albert's wife, and this remaining person there is Christina, for those of you who haven't, haven't met her. And during this visit, we actually ran into uh, Roberto Venosa and Martina, uh, Martina Hoffman. So, this was like a special, special treat. Roberto died about over, over two years ago. He and Martinez was just wonderful, wonderful visionary artists. And this was Albert's favorite uh, music box. And then we also made friends with uh, Hans Reddy Giger, who is an amazing, uh, fantastic realist. You might know him as somebody who got the Academy Award for Alien and inspired the, all the monsters. And, the, and also, they borrowed some of his art for Prometheus. So this is in Gruyere. We became really good friends. His wife, uh, Carmen, did the whole training. She's a, she is a holotropic breathwork practitioner, and he has a wonderful museum in the Greer Castle, and we now had two of our training modules, the, the topic, fantastic realism there, and this was a uh, lunch. We invited Albert for one day, to spend one day with our group, and this was lunch, and the remaining person is, uh, is Steph Sparks, who is the director of the Holotropic Breathwork Training now. And this is uh, Hans Rudi Giger taking uh, uh, Albert for this kind of uh, tour of his museum. You can see the size of uh, these images. Uh, Hans Rudi is just absolute master of the the darkest areas in the in the psyche. Uh, you know, the kind of a, uh, the worst trip that you can that you can experience. I'm holding their uh, LSD, my problem, child. I wrote a, a preface to it, and, and Albert just signed it for me. And here we had a wonderful plenary, uh, I mean, um, round, you know, round table kind of a, a, a discussion. Uh, where uh, Hans Ruedi and Albert represented the two poles. Uh, Albert at this point uh, was uh, four months before his 100th birthday. Okay. And he was very, very, very sharp. He was working on uh, the pharmacology of the pigments that give colors to plants and colors to butterfly wings, and so he was a lover of 
nature. And, you know, Ansuredi was like the other side of the spectrum, like the, uh, the absolute master of the kind of claustrophobic nightmare that, uh, that you can hit uh, in such psychedelic sessions. We walked out of the session, it was like coming from a darshan with a, uh, with a good Indian guru. It was really, a, that was a spiritual uh, darshan rather than a, a scientific presentation. Okay, this was end of the module. The, the person on the right side is Carmen. It's uh, Ansruedi Giga's wife. This was the goodbye. And then I went back four months later for uh, Albert's 100th birthday. This was in the Museum of Natural History. There were all the psychedelic relics for, you know, from all over the world, as you can imagine. Uh, the Bundes president sent a special, special letter. There were all uh, Albert's friends and so on. And then three of us then uh, in the evening went to Burke when there was a celebration of uh, his birthday by the neighbors, which was amazing. Very, very different from this, this one. Uh, there were children, you know, bringing flowers and, and singing songs and saying poems and so on. And LSD was not mentioned once. I don't think the neighbors knew, uh, you know, <laughs> what what Albert was. He was just a you know, wonderful neighbor who just happened to be 100 years, 100 years old. Okay, so this was, this was the 100th birthday. And then two years, uh, two years later was another psychedelic forum in Basel. And Albert was still uh, listed among the speakers but didn't make it at that time. He really didn't feel well, didn't want to uh, leave, but invited uh, the Gigers and, uh, and their photographer. Uh, so we, we had this tremendous uh, privilege of spending an afternoon uh, with him. This is four weeks before he died. And And this is the last picture. You can see he's holding uh, Alex Grace. Uh, and he loved, loved his art. So this Alex, Alex Grace uh, book. Okay. So as I mentioned after this session, uh, all my professional life was focusing on these holotropic states. So about half of the time was clinical work with uh, psychedelics, and at first in the Psychedelic Research Institute in Prague, and then at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, which but there was at the time the last surviving uh, official uh, research in the United States that also Bill Richards was, uh, was part of, and, and Walter Pankey, and Sandy Unger, and other people, Charles Savage. Now, besides the, uh, besides the, the work, clinical work with psychedelics, then uh, uh, 1975, when uh, the, the research in uh, Maryland basically came to an end, I moved to SLN, and then Christina and I developed the holotropic breathwork. You know, um, powerful experiences of a similar kind can be induced by faster breathing, by music, by uh, body work, and we combine it with uh, the mandala mandala uh, drawing. Then uh, over the years, uh, Christina and I also worked with people uh, who had spontaneous episodes of holotropic states. And uh, with all the experience with breath work and psychedelics, we just 
couldn't understand why we shouldn't work with those states the way we work uh, with psychedelics and and uh, with the breath work. And so uh, it became clear that these states, if they are properly understood and properly supported, can actually be, be healing, can be transformative, uh, very much like those induced by psychedelics or uh, by the breath work. And so uh, we started uh, talking about these states as spiritual emergencies. And Christina, 1980, started uh, the, the SEN, the Spiritual Emergence or Emergency uh, Network, where the basic idea was to bring together people who are in these kinds of crises with people who have this alternative understanding and are able to offer uh, uh, help. Uh, the Spiritual Emergence Network now exists you know, in many countries of the world. Unfortunately, it uh, uh, is not in great shape in the United States. It was at uh, CIS and had a special, special area, uh, special telephone lines, a computer, and so on. And then when the funds were cut for the school, this was the most, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, yeah, the one that uh, sort of was, you know, easier, easiest to cut. Sorry, I don't understand. So then uh, I was also interested in a variety of areas where the, the common den denominator was always there were holotropic states as a critical element. So I spent a lot of time with uh, shamans, you know, American shamans, Mexican, uh, South American shamans. Uh, I participated in ceremonies with, uh, with and without uh, psychedelics, with, uh, with native cultures. Uh, I um, had co contact with thanatologists. We ourselves had a large study of uh, cancer patients using psychedelics. So again, near-death experiences was one area that I was very interested in. UFO abduction uh, phenomena, and then the different spiritual systems. Uh, you probably know that Jack Cornfield is a close friend, and we, we did, I think, about 37-day retreats combining the holotropic breathwork and Vipassana Buddhism. We had connection with uh, Tibetan uh, teachers with yogis, particularly Swami Muktananda, you know, with Zen people, Benedictine order, uh, uh, Brother David Stendhal Rast, Father Beat Griffith. We were, again, we were interested what happens, you know, because they are using powerful means of inducing these states. What happens when they are too successful and it sort of opens? Uh, how do they handle it and so on? Uh, so, th uh, this, uh, as I was studying these different forms of holotropic states, it was obvious that current psychiatry and, and psychology simply had no explanation for the kinds of things that were happening or for things that were happening around these experiences. For example, unbelievable synchronicities, something that really challenges the whole kind of linear type of thinking that we have in uh, cause and effect thinking that we have in, in Western science. So um, I was r describing these different challenges in uh, books, and, and some of them were published by State University of New York Press. And uh, when I was approaching my 70th birthday, I got a call from Jane Bunker, who's the editor at SUNY Press, and she said, Stan, you know, we have published some of your books on different aspects of your work. Would you consider writing one book that would put it all together? So it would not be scattered, you know. And then there was a little pause, and then she said, and would you specifically focus on observations and experiences that current psychology and psychiatry cannot explain? And then there was an even longer break, and then she says, and would you just sketch what psychology and psychiatry would have to look like 
uh, to incorporate somehow, accommodate these observations from these holotropic states. It's a kind of a tall order. Uh, but I was very excited because uh, I was about to at least semi-retire, do more reading and writing, and, uh, and we had this training happening all, all over the world. There were a whole new uh, line of teachers. They were teaching in different parts of the world, and we needed a, a manual so that there's some kind of consistency, and this, this was an offer, you know, to, to print one for us. So uh, I decided to write the book, and I gave it a quite, quite deliberately uh, provocative title, the Psychology of the Future. Okay. If you write books like Beyond the Brain or uh, The Holotropic Mind, and you know, I think people can take it or leave it. If you say this is Psychology of the Future, people either get interested or they get pissed. They say, how do you dare, you know? So, uh, now at the same time, I really believe seriously that if we study these states, these holotropic states in, of the different varieties that I described, uh, that it would lead to a revolution in psychiatry and psychology that would be comparable to what happened in physics in the first three decades when the physicists had to move from, from Newton to Einstein and then to quantum physics. And not only that, but that it would be a logical complement to the changes that already happened in our understanding of matter. Actually, the, the, the warmest uh, acceptance of, of uh, these kinds of observations did not come from psychiatrists and psychologists, but from modern physicists. They, they have no problems of, uh, of accepting, for example, certain characteristics of transpersonal experiences and so on, because it's, uh, it's really uh, in, uh, in consonance, you see, with, uh, with quantum relativistic physics. For me, extremely important was uh, the book of Fritjof Kapras. It's the first sort of major bridging when he wrote the Tao of Physics, showing that uh, you know the current scientific disciplines were still stuck in 17th century thinking, and that f physicists, you know, since the turn of the century, the discovery of radioactivity and, uh, and x-rays were already somewhere else, but the other disciplines were still sort of under the spell of the, of the mechanistic, uh, mechanistic thinking. So these were this was the categories uh, where I suggested uh, uh, really radical changes would have to be made. Okay. And so what I will be talking about has two aspects. One is the, how the observations from holotropic states would change psychology and psychiatry. And uh, the other aspect of it would be, if we had a psychology like that, how easy it would be for psychologists and psychiatrists to embrace psychedelics because the, you know, there would not be, they would not be conflict. At this point, it's very difficult for many uh, traditional psychiatrists and psychologists to, to uh, accept uh, psychedelics because uh, the idea is that we are trying to treat people by inducing psychotic states, something that if they appear spontaneously, <laughs> the tremendous effort would be to support, uh, to, to suppress them. So if you had a, if you had a uh, psychology and psychiatry that, that integrates somehow the, the paradigm-breaking challenges, it would be very logical to use things like holotropic breathwork or uh, psychedelic sessions, or it would be understandable why you treat 
spiritual emergencies by helping people to get through them rather than giving them something to suppress what is happening. Because what you find in these states, there's a, uh, there's, there are homeopathic sort of principles operating. If symptoms start emerging, it's, it's a, an effort of the organism to get rid of something. So it's an effort that you want to support, you want to amplify that, you don't want to uh, suppress that. Anyway, so I just go very quickly through that. Uh, the first one is the major one. You see, because there is a basic metaphysical assumption that this is a material universe and therefore life, consciousness, and intelligence are side products, are epiphenomena. Uh, so for billions of years, you know, the universe was just a development of matter, material uh, particles and, and uh, life, consciousness, uh, intelligence were latecomers, like a fluke, sort of in a, in a gigantic uh, universe that happened after, after billions of years of this uh, material evolution. Now, I think very few people, including scientists, realize that we have absolutely no proof that consciousness is generated in the brain. What we have, we have a lot of observations showing systematic correlations between anatomy of the brain, physiology, and, and uh, biochemistry. But we have absolutely no proof that consciousness is coming from the brain. You have a similar situation in the, in, uh, the TV set. You know, the quality of the, of the picture of the sounds critically depends on the components uh, in the set, but that's not a proof that the program is generated in the box. There's still alternative, which is that, that the TV set somehow mediates that, but that the program is coming from somewhere else. Now, this is exactly the logical jump that was made. Uh, so f in terms of uh, formal logic, this would be called non sequitur. It really doesn't follow. Okay. And we have actually a number of observations showing uh, particularly the observations from transpersonal phenomena that uh, consciousness is capable of doing things that the brain could not possibly do. Uh, I will just mention uh, the out-of-body experiences in near-death situations. And, you know, we have now uh, instances where the person is not only in a state of cardiac death, but is a flat EEG. It's, uh, and uh, and consciousness in that state gets out of the body as accurate perception of the of the environment. This Michael Sabum's patient, uh, Pam, you know, was frozen because they they needed to uh, operate on the on uh, an aneurysm at the base of the, and yet that's one of the most detailed uh, um, out of body experiences that is documented. Okay. And uh, many uh, different uh, transpersonal experiences mediate access to um, information of other people, um, sort of uh, members of other species, uh, experiences from other centuries, uh, experiences of mythologies that we have never, never studied, you know, the, the whole Jungian um, collective unconscious, both historical and archetypal. So none of those things can be really explained from, uh, from the, the, the brain. Okay, uh, the second one is the cartography of the psyche. We have a model which limits somehow the psyche to postnatal biography, what happened to us after we were born, and then the individual Freudian unconscious, which is also a kind of derivative of uh, postnatal biography, things that happened to us that we rejected, that we suppressed, that we couldn't accept, and so on. And F Freud called the uh, newborn tabula rasa, uh, the clean slate. There's, there's nothing preceding birth 
that's of interest to psychiatrists, including verse itself. There was, of course, Otto Rank, but it's, it's like a footnote in, in uh, handbooks of psychiatry, kind of historical curiosity, but it's not taken seriously. Unfortunately, the same is true for Jung. Jung is not really uh, exactly embraced by mainstream uh, psychiatry and psychology. So the general thinking is on postnatal, postnatal biography and the individual unconscious. If you work with holotropic states, you have to add two major domains. One is what I call perinatal. There is a record of birth. And I talked about four perinatal matrices related to the experiences related to the stages of birth. You know, the uterus, uh, um, bef uh, the experience in the uterus before contractions, then uh, the stage of birth when there are contractions but the cervix is not open, then the struggle through the birth canal and the cervix opens and then coming out. Each of them represent very distinct experiential matrices and there is a powerful record of that. You can, you can verify many of those experiences, even if people have no intellectual knowledge of, uh, of that process. And then you have to add another m large domain that we now call transpersonal. Identification with other people, uh, experience of group consciousness, uh, experiences of other centuries, of uh, other countries, sometimes with the um, sense of déjà vu, déjà vécu, which is then which it makes a, a past life, a, a karmic kind of experience, uh, experiences of the whole mythological archetypal uh, unconscious, as it was described by Jung. So, the the cartography that you have to use when you work with uh, these holotropic states. Uh, is very much like what you find in the great spiritual philosophies of the East, where somehow uh, the psyche of each person is commensurate somehow with all of existence in the sense that under certain circumstances we have access to information. We can become everything that's part of, a part of existence. So from one perspective, if you think in terms of uh, what things weigh and... and uh, measure, then we are an insignificant part of the universe, but in terms of what we can become in these states experientially, we are in a sense a whole, whole uh, universe. Okay, uh, so that's the cartography of the psyche. Then uh, the architecture of emotional and psychosomatic disorders. In current psychiatry, again, if something is not an organic problem, uh, Alzheimer, you know, temporal tumor, whatever. It's uh, functional, it's psychogenic. The idea is that it happened sometime after we were born. And there is a, uh, in classical psychoanalysis, there is a correlation between stages of libidinal development and certain um, forms of psychopathology. You know, if it's a fix, oral fixation, it would be uh, alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, depression. If it's, uh, if it's um, obsessive compulsive neurosis, it's anal fixation. If it's uh, f um, anxiety, is there like phobias or, uh, or uh, um, conversion hysteria, it's what Freud called phallic fixation and so on. But it, the whole thing happens after we are born. There is not no contribution from anything, including birth, or prenatal state, or certainly not the the transpersonal realm. Now, this you would have to correct if you work with with holotropic states, and you work on a specific problem. You always find something in childhood and in infancy that seems to be significantly related to it. It's not that it's it's wrong but it just sort of describes a certain superficial level of the problem and mistakes it for the, for the whole. So if you work with holotropic states, you would then find additional contributions that come from the different matrices of births and 
and sort of in a in a deep unconscious there would be contributions that would be karmic, that would be archetypal, that would be phylogenetic. So behind emotional and psychosomatic problems, you would have a layered kind of a constellation coming from different different periods. I call them coex systems, systems of condensed experience. Okay, now this looks like very bad news. Okay, we thought all we had to do is to work on some things in, uh, in our childhood, uh, and maybe early childhood, and now it seems like the playground is much, much bigger. Now the good news is that there are very powerful um, therapeutic mechanisms, mechanisms of transformation that uh, become available when your uh, experiential process reaches the perinatal level and then certainly the, uh, the transpersonal level. For example, reliving birth and expressing the pent-up emotions, the pent-up physical energies uh, can be therapeutic in a variety of problems, from claustrophobia where it seems to make a lot of sense, uh, you know, headaches, uh, uh, psychogenic asthma, uh, episodes of violence, violent uh, behavior. Um, so, you know, number number of problems can be at, at least alleviated if you uh, experience birth and express the the emotions and the physical energies. Uh, but there are also powerful mechanisms operating on the transpersonal level. Let's say. Uh, a powerful past life experience, if you bring it into consciousness and you process it, it can be very healing. I've, I've seen instances where the, the, the healing happened, um, you know, the last, you know, the last chapter of the healing process of a particular phobia or uh, psychosomatic pains and so on, who came in the form of a karmic experience or an archetypal experience. In some instances, even demonic archetype emerges so that the session looks like uh, exorcism, really sort of strange demonic energy that can be found behind a particular uh, symptom. One healing mechanism that extremely, uh, that's extremely uh, important, extremely powerful, is uh, experience of cosmic unity when you have the feeling that your boundaries are emerging, you become one with other people, you become one uh, with nature, you become one with the universe, you become one with the divine creative energy. Uh, the irony is that if it happens to you spontaneously, uh, you would get a diagnosis. And uh, they would, uh, if, if, they, if they get you before it's completed, uh, you know, you, it would be sort of stopped by tranquilizers and be kept there in an unfinished, uh, unfinished form. Uh, okay. Uh, now, strategy of uh, how are we doing? Uh, strategy of uh, psychotherapy and, and self-exploration. Now, if you look at the world of psychotherapy, it doesn't look great. You have any number of schools, and each school would tell you something completely different. There's no agreement as to what are the uh, principal motivating forces in the psyche. Why do symptoms develop? What do symptoms mean? How you interpret uh, symptoms? And then each school would give you a different uh, method how you work with your clients to straighten them up, so to say. So if you have a problem, you can flip a coin and you choose a school and with each school comes a different story as to what's wrong with you and you'll be asked to do something different and it will be seen as the scientific you know, method of choice. This is, this is how this is done. Um, and this is not just... Uh, if you would compare, let's say, an approach to a phobia of a behaviorist and a Freudian analyst, 
but even within the Freudian field, the schools that were originally inspired by Freud, they just went into all kinds of different directions. There's a lot of uh, emphasis on interpretation. Where I remember in my own analysis, you know, when I, I would say something and it says, well, this is what you think, but what it really is, is this, which was, of course, the Freudian perspective. Uh, I always have to say the story here. Uh, I had an analyst who was probably in his 60s uh, at the time, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and several of uh, young psychiatrists, uh, uh, you know, were his, uh, in, in analysis with him. And uh, we also had seminars where we sort of referred from, from literature and discussed cases, stories, and so on. And um, one of his little foibles was that he sometimes uh, uh, took a nap, you know, in the, in the session, and you had to sort of try to do something to bring him into the process. <laughs> and uh, one of us asked in these uh, seminars, just a purely theoretical question, you know, what happens when a psychoanalyst falls asleep during therapy? If I keep free associating, does therapy still continue? Is the process interrupted? You know, should you get maybe refunded because <laughs> <laughs> money is so Im important in psychoanalysis? And he didn't say no. This kind of thing doesn't happen in psychoanalysis. You know, he knew we knew, so uh, he had to do something with it. So he said, "Yeah, it can happen. You know, sometimes you are." You are uh, tired, you didn't sleep well, you're recovering from a, from a cold. Um, yeah, it can happen. But if you are in this business for a long time, you develop this sixth sense. You fall asleep only when the stuff that's coming up is irrelevant. <laughs> when something really important emerges, you, you wake up and you're right there. He was also... Uh, he was also an admirer of Ivan Petrovich Pavlov, a Russian physiologist who got a, a Nobel Prize for the uh, discovery of, of conditioned reflexes. And Pavlov talks about uh, inhibition of the cortex and that sometimes you can have a waking point, like in hypnosis. You know, the cortex is inhibited, but you can communicate. And his... Uh, Favorite example was a mother who can sleep through heavy traffic or heavy noises, but when her own child starts moaning, she wakes up. He says, it's just like Pavlov's mother, you know. The stuff that's relevant, you wake up and you're right there. <laughs> so this, you know, this is a very sad situation, and most of us don't even... Um, are not be even bothered by that. Sure, we have you know all these schools, and each says something different. And I get a training in a school. If it doesn't work for me, I just get another training. Uh, so what is what is somehow the alternative that the holotropic states seem to offer? And it's actually something that's very close to uh, where Jung was, at the, you know, in the later years of his life. For uh, Jung, the psyche was not again, in his later years, was not something that was confined in the skull, that was in the brain. The psyche was cosmic. It was anima mundi. And our individual psyche uh, partakes uh, or is teased out of this cosmic, uh, cosmic matrix. So there's no way we can use our intellect to understand the psyche in general uh, or psyche of the client, uh, our client in particular, and then come with some uh, tricks, you see, to fix the, uh, the processes of the psyche. The intellect is just a partial function of, of uh, the psyche that's good for uh, orientation in everyday life, but it cannot, you know, it cannot figure out the psyche and fix it. It's the the psyche is much, much uh, larger. So Jung's uh, approach was uh, you can create a kind of supportive environment 
and within that you, you offer some method uh, through which the, the, cos uh, the conscious ego can communicate with a higher aspect of the client, which he called the self, using a symbolic language. And the therapist is not the fixer, it's not the doer, uh, it's, it's a co-adventurer in Jung's uh, um, terminology. Jung was using active imagination. It's, it's compared to Freud who was analyzing dreams that you had in the past, sometimes dreams that were months old or years old. Uh, Jung wanted the material to emerge uh, so to say, in statuna sandy, you see, as it was being born, and he had an idea which is very similar to him, to the principles of psychedelic therapy or the holotropic breathwork. That in that situation, uh, what emerges is uh, some important, sufficiently charged um, material from the unconscious that's close enough to the surface to be available for processing that day. And then something else is deeper, you will have to wait for that. But, but you want some, something that sort of creates a situation where now what was unconscious is becoming conscious. And it's a, it has its own order of emerging. So the, th the therapeutic process is guided from within by the, by the self-healing intelligence. It's not a brilliant insight and, and interpretation of the, uh, of the therapist. So that's a very, very important aspect of the work with holotropic states, that the, the, the idea of the self-healing, self-healing intelligence. Uh, it also sort of uh, reflects the original meaning, of, uh, Greek meaning of the word therapeutes, which is not the fixer, it's not the doer, it's somebody who intelligently cooperates in the healing process. And it comes from the, from the temple incubation in, in uh, ancient, ancient Greece. Okay, um, I guess the role of spirituality should be clear now. In uh, traditional psychiatry, which is, you know, materialistic, uh, there's really not a whole lot of tolerance for spirituality. I mean, this, the universe, the history of the universe is the history of developing matter. And, uh, and consciousness is a product of, the math, of, of material processes. So where is their place for spirit? You know, what are you talking about? So if you are spiritual or religious from a strictly psychiatric point of view, you really don't know your science. Uh, um, there's uh, something to do with uh, superstition, uh, you know, with ignorance, with magical, magical thinking, primary, primary process. Uh, um, if you have, uh, if you have the uh, sort of a spiritual belief system, and you are an intelligent person. Uh, like Einstein or some of the people who uh, created quantum physics, you know, Niels Bohr, uh, Schrodinger, uh, Heisenberg, and so on, they all were, you know, uh, mystics. Uh, then we have uh, psychoanalysis, then you have some unfinished business from childhood where you sort of looked at your parents as these divine figures, and now if uh, if you think about God, it's basically that infantile image that you are projecting with your mother or your father now becoming God, gods and goddesses. And uh, if you have spiritual experience, you get, you get a diagnosis. Now, if you, if you work with holotropic states, you develop uh, you know, a lot of respect for spirituality. You realize that when your process of self-exploration reaches at least the perinatal level, a new quality comes into your experience, which uh, Jung called numinosity. He actually, he actually borrowed it from Rudolf Otto. Numinosity. He, he didn't like terms like religious, mystical, spiritual, because uh, they can be easily misunderstood. Numinous is a nice, uh, neutral term. 
but you basically move into a, an experiential space which is radically different from uh, the, the world that you live in uh, in your everyday life. There is a sense of sacredness, uh, holiness about it. There is, a, there is a convincing sense that that reality is actually superordinated to this reality. That in, in a sense it even forms and informs uh, this uh, reality. And this then makes a spiritual quest a, a legitimate uh, uh, endeavor, you see, rather than some kind of a kooky sort of uh, 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 ignorant sort of activity. Okay, so we, we will not go into, uh, into the last one. We are just finishing a CIS uh, course, in Psyche and Cosmos. I've uh, been working about 30 years with Rick Tarnas, who's this brilliant psychologist and, and uh, um, astrologer. And uh, we have found out that the only way you can really predict uh, what kind of psychedelic session you would have, what kind of holotropic session you would have, is to uh, use transit astrology. You can get a, a, an archetypal prediction, not a con concrete prediction. But you basically get tuned into the uh, archetypal fields related to uh, the transiting, currently transiting uh, planets. Uh, so this would be, you know, opening a, another can of worms, uh, and uh, it really would uh, require a lot of time. But uh, uh, if you are interested, I have a uh, personal website, which is my full name, SanislavGrub.com. You can find uh, several of the articles on uh, how we use in the, uh, the astrology in, in uh, the work with holotropic, uh, holotropic states, and there are all kinds of other articles as well. Okay, so, uh, we'll end this, uh, this part. This is basically kind of a, a theoretical uh, preparation. Uh, you know, the kind of psychology that you have to bring into the session. First of all, that you are not crazy if you have a past life experience, or a death rebirth experience, or if you experience yourself as a as a, uh, some kind of animal, uh, those are all sort of uh, normal capacities of the of the psyche. And then the uh, most important thing: really trusting your own inner healing capacity, the the self healing process. Not to bring any kind of concepts that about things that you read, uh, uh, things that you were taught as part of some school, really go into the session with what uh, the Zen Buddhists called uh, the um, beginner's mind. As if you didn't know anything about this process, you're just there breathing faster, deeper than usual, just being uh, like in Vipassana, Buddhist meditation, being prepared for any experience that emerges, let it happen and let it go. So you're always uh, prepared to be surprised but by what emerges uh, spontaneously. So uh, thank you for your patience. We'll take a short break and uh, <laughs> then talk about what we'll be doing. Yeah.